Hi there, friends. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the great love chapter. And we're looking very carefully at what God tells us about genuine love. What we really have here is a picture, a portrait of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he wants his church, that's all the believers in the world, to be like him. So get your Bibles and let's talk about it. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're looking at verses 4 through 7, and they tell us how genuine, godly love really behaves. We know that in the context, the Apostle Paul is presenting a portrait of love in contrast to the behavior of the Corinthians. They were a church, he has told us, without love. And without love, he says, we are absolutely nothing. This is the way they were behaving at the time, a loveless church. So the Corinthians needed to be taught what God's love is like because they didn't have it. Paul is presenting this in contrast to what they were and how they behaved. So I'm afraid that oftentimes I, all of us perhaps, are like the Corinthians. So what have we learned so far? We've already seen that love is long-suffering, enduring, patient, and kind. Love is not jealous. It never brags. It's not puffed up. It's never rude. And so this is God's inspired, infallible, inerrant word. So here is God's own definition of what love is. And when he defines it, he defines it on the basis of what love does. So always remember, I don't know that I can say this often enough. This is not about how you feel. This is about a choice of behavior. You don't find emotions here. You find choices of behavior. So love can only really be described by observing it in action. Love is something you do. It is not a feeling. It is a choice of behavior. So what have we seen? Love is patient with people. Love is kind, and we saw that that means useful to other people. It's never jealous. It never seeks anything for itself. So it doesn't want what other people have. In fact, it's a pleas for others to have what they have. Love is never boastful. It's not a windbag. And so it's not puffed up, meaning that it does not have this inner attitude that results in a bragging windbag mouth. That was the word in the original language. Love is not rude. Rude people are self-centered, self-righteous, and love is never that. God is never that. Jesus was never that. Love is not selfish. It does not seek its own. It doesn't seek its own way. It does not ever be self-centered. Love seeks the satisfaction and the edification of others. It's selfless. So we closed our study last time with the seventh of the 15 qualities used here that describe agape love. Agape love is God's love. It is the way God loves. So let's begin now with number eight. Let's just begin reading in, number, in verse four. And so we have them all in our minds. Verse four, love is patient. Love is kind, is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Love does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, is not easily provoked. That's where we are today. Now, let me tell you, this word easily is not in the earliest manuscripts. The scholars tell us that probably some scribe, someone who was translating scripture to paper, put the word in there. So that word easily, we cannot use it as a license. We cannot use it to give us permission to be provoked because what it really says is love is not provoked. Now, what does that mean? That literally means irritated or upset or angry. It has to do with this sudden outburst of emotion. 
maybe kind of like a temper tantrum. Uh, we could say that love is not touchy or bad tempered. Uh, it is not temperamental, ticky. So this quality though is not ruling out righteous indignation. Righteous indignation is when we are angered by things that anger God. And so the provocation that is referred to here has more to do with those things that are done to us personally. If somebody hurts my feelings or if somebody attacks me, scripture gives me ways of dealing with that. But righteous indignation is when it's attacking God and his character. Like Jesus in the temple when he overturned the tables of the money changers. What was he protecting? He was protecting the Father. It was not a personal offense. He was offended because it was an offense to God. So there's a difference between defending ourselves and defending God's righteousness. So love never, this, this kind of love, God's love never personally gets on the defensive. Certainly there are some things that uh, need to and are going to provoke us. Um, that's not all bad. So don't misunderstand. But being angry and out of control is not love. And that's what he's talking about here when he says love is not provoked. And some say, oh, I just lose my temper sometimes, but it's over in just a little bit. Well, so is an atom bomb. So we don't have time here to discuss the devastation that temper can have to ourselves and to the people around us. But just know that in his description of love, he's saying love doesn't do that. That's not characteristic of God's love. Out of control conduct of any kind is not Christ-like. So love is not provoked. Look at the next one. Love thinketh no evil. Thinketh no evil. The Greek word here is a bookkeeping term. That's interesting, isn't it? Translated thinketh. Uh, this is a term that means to calculate when making an entry into a ledger. And so the purpose of entering anything into a ledger is to remember it, is to have a record of it. it, it it's to have it there so that it can be consulted, referred to at any point in time. A later date. So you write things down in a ledger so you won't forget them. So what is this saying? What he's saying here is that love does not keep a record of wrongs done to it. Love doesn't keep a list of things that happen. Uh, love forgives. Why? God forgives and God is love. So the original word here is interesting because it is the same word that is used in the New Testament to speak of the pardoning act of God. God is a pardoning God. So when we say love thinketh no evil, it's not going to keep a record of wrong. It's not going to keep a memory of something that you can refer back to to hold it against somebody later. You know, God does not keep records of our sin. Is that not an awesome thought? No record of our sin. So when sin is placed under the blood of Christ, there's no more record of it. It's cleansed. And so the only entry in God's ledger for the believer is not guilty. Paid in full. Righteous. So God does not keep a record of our sins to remember them against us. Is he aware of them? Yes. Does he remember them? Yes, because he's God. But he does not keep a record of, of them to keep them, to hold them against us. Christ's blood pays for our sin, all of our sin. And his righteousness then is placed to our account on God's ledger, on the books, Whenever we trust Christ, whenever we place our faith in Christ, give him free access to our lives. When we bow before him, knowing that we are sinners, knowing that we need a savior, and we ask him to be that in our lives, to teach us. So as God has not keep, kept records of our sin, as he's not keeping records of our sin, we're not to keep records of the sins of others. That's his business. You know, resentment comes when we just keep on 
reviewing and going over the record of sins that we know other people have against us. That produces bitterness. Bitterness produces all kinds of horrible things. And so this reviewing the record of sin creates this resentful attitude. And when we've got a record of it, we can brood over it and we can turn it into hostility. And before long, we don't have it. It has us. And so love, God's love, doesn't keep a record of wrong. It does not make memories of evil. Love turns the sin over to God. That's what we do with it. When we have an offense, when someone is, when we are offended with somebody or about something, we give it to God. We lay it at the cross. We let him deal with it. Vengeance belongs to him. So love just turns the sin or the offense over to God. Love forgives. That's what God does. And God is love. Love doesn't get irritated. It is never resentful. Doesn't keep a record of evil done to it. So that's the way Jesus loved. That's the way God loves. And that's the way he calls us to love. Now that's hard, isn't it? The irritated part kind of probably hits home to all of us. Um, I'm most likely to get irritated when I'm tired or when I'm distracted by a lot of things, you know? And so what do we do? We're going to call our minds back to the things of God. We're going to submit our minds to God in that moment. And when that happens, then we surrender to him and he's going to take it. He will take it and we will be able to obey him in doing these things. Well, number 10, Love rejoices not in iniquity. Love rejoices not in iniquity. We've been through a list. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself. Is not puffed up. Does not misbehave. Does not seek its own way. Is not easily provoked or is not provoked. And now does not keep a record of wrongs. And now he says, does not rejoice in iniquity. So this is the last one in that list of things love is not. Things love does not do. So it does not rejoice in iniquity. This is a hard one. Iniquity means unrighteousness. Love never delights or rejoices in sin. Love never finds satisfaction from sin, from evil, from unrighteousness, whether it's our own sin or the sin of others. Now, in my heart, this is a big one. This is a big one. Because to rejoice in unrighteousness is to delight in that which breaks the Father's heart. Now, let me ask you a question. We don't delight in tragedies or hurts that happen to our friends and loved ones, do we? So why would we find rejoicing? Why would we find delight in what hurts God's heart? We sometimes just fall into it, really, without knowing what we're doing, don't we? We just float right into some of these things because of our humanity, because of our sinfulness, and because that sin nature that's left in us. So we don't want to do that to our heavenly father. So we learn to think differently. We learn to be careful because there are a whole lot of different ways that we rejoice in sin. Think about it. Some people rejoice in their own sin. Did you ever hear anybody bragging about what they did? Bragging about how much they drank? Bragging about uh, how they told somebody off? Bragging about how they cut somebody off in traffic? That's rejoicing in unrighteousness, bragging. Now, first of all, we've already said love doesn't brag, but when we brag about sin, eh, that's not a good thing, is it? And it breaks the Father's heart. Sometimes people um, read books and magazines that rejoice in unrighteousness. Um, books that have all kinds of stuff in them that are not of God. Magazines. What about pornography? What delight are we finding in some of those sinful things? What about TV shows and movies that glorify sin? So we pay our money and we go to these things and we go, yay! 
at the sin. God's love doesn't do that. That sin, as we are like Jesus, is going to do what to us? It's going to break our hearts. You know, violence and crime and immorality cause the news media to just flourish. Don't you wish sometimes that you could see something good on the news? Well, why do we not? Because people are drawn to the violence and the immorality and to the bad things that show up on the news. And so then there is gossip. Do you ever delight in gossip? Juicy gossip? Ooh, I want to hear what's going on. What's the gossip today? Rejoicing in unrighteousness. Keeping an account of wrong or feeling self-righteous about not doing what other people are doing is kind of the same thing. Um, how about taking comfort in the fact that I'm not the only one who did it? Did you ever find satisfaction in that. Well, I did it, but I was not the only one. So we're happy with that. What are we? We're rejoicing in unrighteousness. We're happy that we were not the only one who was involved in that unrighteousness. You know, and so we have to be careful about that. That's something that we have to set our minds to be careful about because we're prone, we're prone to do that. So Paul has listed here eight things that love is not, or that love does not do. And now he's going to list five positive things. Five positive things. Verse six, you see it. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Or some tra translations say rejoices in the truth. Um, when it's talking about truth here, it's not talking about just mere facts. <coughs> Excuse me. This is talking about God's truth. Jesus is truth, isn't he? Didn't he say, I am the way, the truth, and the life? And so Jesus is truth. And so love is unable to be glad or find joy in any presence of falsehood. Nothing that is false. And so love rejoices when truth is taught, when truth is lived. But this is an interesting contrast here to me. Love rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Now, love has no pleasure in hearing or repeating or propagating or watching or performing unrighteousness. Love is not happy with that. The Holy Spirit in us is going to respond negatively with that. We're going to feel convicted. We're going to feel something negative when we find pleasure in unrighteousness. Uh, love, God's love, God himself is never happy about sin. It's own sin or anybody else's sin. Anybody's sin. Any kind of sin. We're not to find joy in it. But it does rejoice when God's truth is heard or repeated or propagated or watched or performed. It's all about God's truth. So people who love to tell the truth, love the truth. Truth needs to be characteristic of the life of a believer. Lies are not ever of God. Lies are not of God. So love, this love it's telling us, cannot endure lies or anything else that is not of God. God hates lying. It's very clear, stated very clearly even in the Old Testament. So let's just absorb that love is honest. And so this is about behaving in truth and thinking in truth. And this is factual, daily truth, and it's God's truth. Love demonstrates truth in all aspects of daily behavior. Love cares about truth. Love loves the truth. Love upholds the truth. Love speaks the truth. And so we need to realize that truth sometimes can be painful. Some may consider truth to be an offensive message. Don't want to hear it. Rather hear lies. Sometimes lives are more comfortable. But my dad used to say that 
your best friend is a person who will always be willing to tell you what you don't want to hear. That's a good thought. To be able to be truthful, and sometimes the truth is encouraging and comforting, but sometimes it is challenging, and it brings conviction. It brings knowledge that we need to do something differently, but sometimes it brings relief. Now, I want to give a word of caution here. This is not a license to tell a thing because it's the truth. Um, we don't need to overuse this. We need to be discerning. We need to let the Holy Spirit discern in us what truth needs to be told and when it needs to be told and how it needs to be told. So we don't just say, well, that's the truth, so I'm going to go tell it. No, no. Scripture tells us that we're to speak the truth in what? Love. Speak the truth in love. You know what love? This love weeps over sin. Remember? It weeps over unrighteousness. And it never finds delight in exposing the weaknesses of others. It's gentle. Even when those things are true. So we have to be very careful and we tell the truth with the same gentleness that Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount when he tells us how to remove a splinter from the eye of a brother or sister. What does he say? First, check out to see what's in your own eye. See if you have a boulder in your own eye. And if you're going to take a splinter out of somebody else's eye, how are you going to do it? You're going to do it gently, slowly, carefully, thoughtfully, first of all, having dealt with your own vision. So truth is something to be handled like a treasure. Now, we not only speak truth, but we need to seek to know the truth. Sometimes, you know, we fall so guilty. I do. We all do. I think of falling into a trap of telling something before we know if it's true or not or of examining the truth of the situation. It's so easy, it is so easy in this world to become acclimated to falsehood because it is so common. We're used to it. You know, you see the news, you don't know if it's the truth or not. That is not to be so with God's people. It is not to be so with believers. We cannot fall into this mindset, well, everybody does it. No. This is what God's telling us we, he expects of us. And so sometimes we get comfortable with partial truth. Let me tell you something. Partial truth is not truth. Partial truth is lie. It's part lie. It's as much lie as it is truth. So we have to be careful to be discerning. And what are we going to do? We're going to hold these thoughts before the Lord. So let's think about it. What are some things we do? How about exaggerating? You know, the old fish tales. I caught a fish. I'll bet that fish weighed six pounds when it really weighed two. How do we do that? How do we do that in other ways? We all got our own quirks. But exaggeration is not truthful. We need to learn to think the truth, to recognize truth, so that we can speak the truth. Have you ever heard of white lies? Where in God's word do we read about white lies? Nowhere. What are white lies? They're lies. I don't care what color they are. They're lies. And it's so easy, and so many times we use them because we don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. You know how it is. You get invited to a party, and you think, oh, I don't want to do that. So, you, you know, I believe I've got something else to do. You may not. It may be sit at home in your chair. That kind of carelessness is what our attention needs to be called to. And we don't want to hurt somebody else's feelings. And so I think our prayer is going to be, Lord, show me how to tell the truth while being loving and kind and merciful. And even if it's taking the splinter out of somebody else's eye, to do it that gently. What about the times we're guilty of drawing conclusions about people or situations that are just based on assumptions? Sometimes we see a situation and it just looks like something happened, so we assume that it did, when maybe it didn't happen at all. Um, do I ever tell somebody my conclusions without really knowing if they're the truth? 
It's easy to pass on false information without thinking, hey, I think I'll go out and pass on some false information. We slide into it. The devil has access to us in those ways. And so, you know, we, we harm sometimes a person's reputation by just passing on information that I don't know to be fact. One of the hard things for me that I've seen be so devastating is when we just assume we know something without asking questions. Ask enough questions to know the truth. Seek the truth. Go after the truth. Know what the truth is about the situation. We can never judge another person's heart. You don't really know what was in that person's heart. Maybe you need to have a conversation with them instead of just assuming something bad. So we're to be speakers of truth and seekers of truth. This tells us love rejoices in truth. And if you're going to rejoice in truth and the truthfulness of God's word, all truths are not to be rejoiced in, are they? That's not what it's talking about. I'm not going to rejoice if somebody uh, that, that I love is caught in sin. I'm not going to be rejoiced. But I'm going to rejoice that God's truth is going to be revealed and that it's going to come to us and he's going to use that truth. We all need God's help in learning genuine love, don't we? My goodness, how convicting it is to just read this list, to just start considering these qualities of God's genuine love, patience, kindness, humility, not easily angered, temper, irritability, keeping records of wrong, never rude or jealous, never bragging. Ooh. When I read that list, I'm convicted because I know I'm guilty. What do we do? What do we do when we, when we say, God, this is, I, I'm guilty. I slide into all of these things. Well, we acknowledge our sin to the Lord. We go to the Lord and say, hey, I know. I see this in me. And so I agree with him about it. I'm not like Jesus. I'm not good at doing these things. I'm not good at long-suffering and kindness and all of these things that you've listed here. And so what do we do then? We ask him for his forgiveness and cleansing, and we thank him for it. What does he tell us in 1 John 1, 9? If we confess our sins, that is, agree with God about them. If we agree with God about that sin, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that a good word? Isn't that good news? We ask him, and we ask him, and we thank him, and we just ask him to help us be like Jesus. I'm a long way from that. He gives us this so that we can work toward it. And in our process of sanctification, where he's got the Holy Spirit in us to convict us of these things, we want to cooperate with him so that we can begin to look like Jesus and to love the way Jesus loves. Together, we have to work on it, don't we? We have to help each other do this. We have to be reminded. But we've got to start with the truth of God's Word being in our minds. We're going to be renewed in our minds so that we can become that living sacrifice that God has called us to be. Next week, we get to the climax. I can't wait. You study it ahead of time, and I'll see you then. Thank you.